So to kick things off, um, my name is Byron Tassonio Rash. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of We Discover. We're a performance marketing technology agency, so we like to bridge the worlds between paid search and using technology in interesting ways. Um, there's essentially going to be two elements to this. One is going to be the introduction to the concept, so utilizing demand and supply. And the second element is going to be taking you through a, a case study, so how we use this in the real world with the AA. So in terms of definitions, um, very simply demand, uh, we get to work in kind of search, which is very lovely because we get to see impressions, clicks, conversion value um, from a kind of demand perspective for customers. So the kind of need of a product or service from a company. And supply is where things get a little bit tricky. And this is a business's ability to uh, supply their customers. And ability is the key word there because you might have um, supply in terms of products. So e-commerce might have um, you know, various size of shirts, but on a particular day, if a customer comes to the site and for whatever reason, um, it's out of stock, their ability to supply is hindered. And this is where things can get complicated, right? So demand and supply is not static. They're ever changing. So there's two things. One, um, A, it can cause uh, challenges, i.e. if performance marketers don't know that there's a supply issue that can cause issue in terms of sales. Um, but B, if performance marketers can understand the supply and demand factors, it can create really interesting opportunities for you to take advantage of that information. So I wanted to get into why we even looked at this in the first place. So we were working with the AA and um, we were looking at kind of historic performance. And we had, um, we saw this kind of number, this 3% average conversion rate. And um, what we were going through is we were looking at um, kind of a couple of layers beneath that. So what we noticed is that locations performed drastically different. So certain locations were converting at 0.5, 1%. Certain locations were converting at 8, 9, 10%. And this is a relatively high volume account. So these are kind of interesting things to, to look at. And um, that kind of led us down this rabbit hole of trying to understand why these locations were performing so differently. Like what were the factors that made customers either convert incredibly well or not? So we, um, we wanted to jump into kind of concept of factors. Like what are the factors that lead to uh, a percentage increased likelihood of someone converting? So we came up with a bunch of them, the price, competition, availability, user experience, about kind of 12 other ones. And we did two things. One is we looked at all the kind of qualitative information that the AA had. So customer insights, research, interviews. I spoke with a few people who were trying to book a kind of driving lesson themselves just to understand what they were thinking about. And then qualitative metrics, so like how do they, um, what's the price difference between the competitors? What is kind of Hotjar telling us in terms of how they kind of behave on site, et cetera. And what we determined after all of this is that the most important factor for the AA in this particular industry, uh, selling this particular product was availability. And that's going to be different for every single brand. It's probably going to be different for different customer profiles within, uh, within uh, kind of a singular company. But for this particular brand, for this particular service, it was availability. And it made sense from a kind of logical perspective. What you're trying to do if you're booking a driving lesson is you are looking at your driving instructor's availability, a calendar basically, and your calendar, and you're trying to match up these two areas where you find slots. So on one side, if there was very limited availability, i.e. for the next five weeks, this instructor's booked, the chance that you're going to bounce and go somewhere else is relatively high. And the opposite's true. If there's loads of availability, there's a chance of you finding something that works for you is, again, going to be quite high. And this is what we thought made up the difference between a 0.5 conversion rate versus a kind of 10% conversion rate. Um, so that's us jumping down the rabbit hole. If you, if you know this, if you can identify the factors, then that creates an interesting opportunity, right? You have kind of a asymmetric information. You have information that Google does not have. So now the kind of next logical step is to try and utilize that in an interesting way. So. First thing, identify the factors. For us, it was availability. Then next is what we're going to get into, which is the uh, case study. So like I said, the AA is our client. We've been working with them for about cut, four years or now, and they came to us for the challenge, which was make pupil acquisition work for instructors. 
which basically means keep instructors busy and keep kind of pupils uh, in the kind of driving lessons and uh, try to make sure that um, uh, instructors stay around for a very long time because they have loads and loads of lessons. The problem is that there's always a complication, which is the AA has you know 2,000 driving instructors across the country, every single postcode, uh, basically, and every single instructor across every single postcode has different availability. They have a different calendar. They work different days, different hours. They're all, all going to be booked at different rates. And um, what this basically means is you have this kind of concept of dynamic inventory, which is as a performance marketer, the thing you're selling is constantly changing underneath you. It's like a sand dune. It's always shifting, which can cause these, um, these kind of issues with these conversion rates where you see really low ones because availability is not there or really high ones because it is there. So that um, led us to the project that we wanted to kick off, which was A, we knew availability was an important thing. B, we wanted to solve this issue for pupil acquisition. So we created a project. Of course, we gave it a nice name, which is Project Themis, which is all about balancing, balancing demand and supply. So when we started, we knew there were uh, kind of few things we wanted to get out of the system. And um, some of them involved, we needed to know um, across the country, uh, across every single instructor, who had availability. So who had slots within their calendar. We needed to understand um, past performance. So CPCs, impressions, conversion rates, et cetera. We needed to get this data from the AA, kind of clean it up. We needed to make some sort of forecasts in terms of what performance would look like if we push budget into certain areas. We needed um, essentially this to be automated. 2000 instructors, every single one of them with different calendars. There's no way we could do this kind of manually. Uh, we needed to create a report and then also give us an alert if any single one of those elements broke down at any, any stage. So I could probably spend the next kind of two hours chatting about the, the kind of model itself, but I'll, I'll, I kind of selected three key areas and wanted to chat about specifically. The first thing is we, we, we had to kind of invent a number to try and rank instructors by availability, um, which would basically help us to identify where in the country we had the most stock supply, et cetera. So we created something called a need score, i.e. instructor needs a pupil because they have a lot of availability. So we, we kind of came up with this uh, concept of a need score. And there's a couple of things we had to do. One is we had to understand which instructors had availability, needed pupils, and we needed to do this at scale. So I'm gonna skip over the kind of 500 hours of data cleaning and building pipelines to the calculation that we ended up with, which was this, and I'm gonna jump into what it's made up of. So this is the instructor's need score, it's a single metric that we can use to rank instructors. And then it's made up of two things. One is an instructor cap. Uh, and essentially, once we started looking at some of the information, we saw kind of really big outliers that would influence the entire model. So we basically put guardrails in place to make sure that there was some sort of standardization across the information that we were getting from the AA. And then two was this correction factor, which basically meant everything that happens in the last 30 days is the most important data. Anything that happens kind of prior before that, like 60, 90 days, gets, um, gets devalued. It still gets taken into account, but it's just less important. And the reason it's less important is that when you're dealing with availability, um, the most recent data, as in recency, is much more important because you need something, you need availability now in order to sell it. So that's why we kind of upweighted anything that was uh, fairly recent. And then this is the first time that we actually saw, like everything up until now was theoretical. So once we put the data into place, we could see how across the country um, uh, instructor need was changing, which essentially means like all the kind of blue areas is where we needed new pupils. And there's three things that this kind of told us. Uh, one is that we could see uh, drastic changes on a kind of daily basis in terms of where we needed new pupils, which was good because this is the kind of entire theory that we built around at this stage. Uh, two, there were kind of pockets of areas that just constantly needed new pupils like the Midlands, Southeast, et cetera. Um, and then three, if we flip this and we just targeted the entire country, everything in gray basically doesn't need any new pupils. So there would be a tremendous amount of spend that would go into areas that basically didn't need anything. They didn't need any new pupils, which essentially would be wasted spend. So this is a kind of good step 
The, the next bit we wanted to do was think about budget distribution. We had to work with the theory that there was always going to be a fixed limited amount of budget and we had to use this in the most kind of efficient way possible. Um, so there was two things we were trying to do. One is identify where is the best place to spend this money and um, two is to create a budget per postcode. So the way we ended up structuring the cam uh, campaigns is that we had a campaign per postcode so we needed a budget for that. So it's kind of three steps that we went through. One is um, uh, identify every single instructor that needed new pupils. Um, so let's say we had 200 of them. Uh, the first step was relatively simple. We had a fixed budget. You just divide one by the other and you get a budget per instructor. Then we needed to see how many of those instructors who needed pupils were in a singular postcode. So then you kind of add them all together. And then the last step is taking some sort of historical performance into account. So having a look at past conversion rates, CPCs, impressions, et cetera. And there's two reasons for this. One is to, with budget being incredibly important, we wanted to make sure that if we allocated it towards a certain postcode, there was enough demand from the market that we could actually spend it. And two, the second thing is that um, when we start making some calculations over what we think performance should look like, we need to take into account some sort of like performance uh, forecast. So that then shifted budget around a little bit. And budget distribution kind of sounds simple, but there's quite a lot of caveats that come into it. One is there's um, instructors can offer it in multiple postcodes, so we need to create some sort of weighting over where they spend most of their time. Uh, two, we wanted to increase the likelihood that if a user came to the site, they would actually pick the instructors who were in need of pupils and not the instructors who weren't in need. Again, this is complicated because we can't force any pupil to pick the ones that we think that they need to pick. So we needed to weight that, ensure that we had enough instructors in need within a certain area. Uh, and then three, we need to make sure that a region had enough need, which basically means um, like on the GIF where locations are popping in and out, some of, some of that is going to be solved by organic conversions. So we don't necessarily need to distribute paid marketing behind that because the incremental value is just not going to be there. So we needed to make sure that there was enough need for us to do that. So in terms of an example, let's take like Oxford area. And um, what we would do is to run through how many instructors existed within that postcode. Of those, how many were in need? We then made an assumption over how many pupils would solve that need. So, you know, 60 pupils would solve a need for kind of four or five instructors, et cetera. We then needed to make a calculation over how many organic conversions we would get. And then the difference would be any incremental pupils that we needed to get. And that would then help us with the budget distribution problem because we could then allocate the budget according to that incremental need. Then we moved on to CPC limits. And, um, you talk to me afterwards if you want, but we went, basically went through five examples or experiments to understand what was the best structure and what was the best bidding strategy we needed to employ. So we used things like um, TBRAS, uh, TCPAs, went through manual CPCs at some stage. But what we found is the best in terms of control and efficiency for us within this model was a max click strategy with the CPC limit. Um, and the reason for that is from a kind of control perspective, we had uh, the most control in terms of pushing and pulling spend really quickly with those strategies. 99.99% of the case, you shouldn't do that. You should do smart bidding. But in this case, because we had this thing of asymmetric information, we had all this data that Google did not have. In this case, it worked out to be best because we could be really reactive with uh, pushing and pulling spend. So this is the calculation that we use to, to do that at a kind of postcode level. And it's quite simple. It's, it's just taking the kind of expected conversion rate within a certain location. Um, and then um, if, if locations di didn't have enough data, what we would do is look at like proxy locations. So areas next to them or areas that looked like them and then borrow some of their historical data to make the calculations. Um, and then also the max spend that we were willing to pay per pupil. And this varied. So there were certain locations where we were uh, willing to spend above our kind of average threshold because the incremental value was there, i.e. we had to really get a lot of new pupils to reduce need. And or uh, we would be under the max CPA because we thought we could acquire pupils relatively easily. So, but at, at a kind of average level, we wanted a certain CPA. Then in terms of the, um, like all of this coming together, we essentially um, built the kind of system, which was taking past performance data from Google that would go into our BigQuery 
get information from the, um, the client, which was the kind of instructor side, model that, add that together. That would then create the new calculations in terms of what needs to be pushed back into Google. Um, so we used APIs to push this back into Google in terms of changes for budgets and activating or deactivating campaigns. So everything was built out at a postcode level already. And all the model did was enable or pause campaigns, set CPC limits, and then set the budgets. Um, they would then pump out their kind of reports that we used and any kind of alerting went to the Slack in this case. And um, the, the only kind of manual intervention that we had at this stage was um, when the budgets were calculated off the back of the model, it would go to a human, that human would authorize that, and then the model would run. And the reason we do this is because, A, we want to make sure that if we're spending, there's not kind of crazy values that are being placed uh, into kind of a live environment, and B, there is some sort of oversight in terms of the model. So then it, um, it all comes together, which essentially means um, we were getting input data from a kind of supply perspective from an instructor side, uh, the model would make the calculations in terms of CPC limits, budgets, et cetera, push that into Google. And um, the, over, uh, the only kind of human oversight was the, um, the kind of manually checking that the budgets were, were sensible. In terms of the results, um, what we then saw was uh, the target was over a six month period to try and get 1,200 pupils using an average of 84 pound CPA. This average was what was being historically achieved and the logic of using the same average across what was done previously manually versus what was done within the demand supply model is that within the demand supply model, there was very, very little human oversight. So essentially, if we could achieve the same CPA with very limited resource, it would still be a win for the business. Um, what actually ended up being is that we got uh, over 2000 pupils and the CPA reduction of 71%, so down to 24 pounds. Um, and this kind of reduction in CPA essentially is just down to reducing wasted spend because what, what the model essentially does is it looks at where in the country do we have the best supply, the most availability, and we just deploy all of our budget just to those areas and kind of solve that need. So within kind of demand and supply, if we can identify those factors, like the performance differences can be quite drastic because we didn't do anything clever in terms of new ad copy, new landing pages, anything like that. It's just purely deploying spend to places where we had the best supply that we can meet our kind of customers' needs. So the last couple of things is just um, a couple of takeaways. And um, I know I just spent the last 10 minutes talking about automation, but this kind of 80-20 rule really does apply here, which was if you can identify the factors, the most important things for your customers, and you can use that information somehow within your campaign. So either structurally, ad copy wise, landing page wise, just use it somehow. Um, you're probably 80% of the way there. The automation element is the kind of cherry on top, the 20%, but just utilizing the information really is gonna be most of the benefit. Average is hide gold mine, which basically means this entire thing started because we saw a 3% conversion rate and we looked kind of two levels deeper and started asking questions over like, why do certain locations perform differently? And the entire thing was built around those questions. Uh, three, uh, I'm kind of a big believer in kind of performance marketers, uh, getting to understand the business operations. So understand how supply works, understand how new stock is ordered from different warehouses, understand how driving instructors get trained and then deployed, like all these things start to help build up a, a kind of framework for you to, to think about how you utilize some of that information within uh, your accounts. And probably the last important thing is uh, trying to identify those factors, those kind of demand factors. And there will be a range of them. People will care about a lot of them, but in many cases, there will be one or two that are more important than everything else. And if you can identify those, you can use it everywhere from a structural perspective, from a creative perspective, from uh, the landing page user experience and um, yeah it, it, it really is a thing that um, unlocked uh, a lot of value for us so that's it thank you very much um, my name is Byron Sonia Resch I'll be around afterwards if anyone wants to have any questions